We are so thankful to have all of you here this morning. It is great to see some folks out this morning who I have not seen in over a year. Um, So it is great to have you guys back. It is great just to be together. And each week as more people are getting vaccinated and more people are feeling more comfortable, our numbers are just increasing and increasing. And it is just wonderful to see. Um, It's great to just be able to come together and see so many smiling faces on Sunday morning. Um, Before we get going, I do want to take just a moment to thank Jesse for stepping up and leading the singing for us this morning and doing an excellent job at that. For those of you who haven't had a chance to meet Jesse yet, Jesse has been coming to the church here for a couple of months now since he moved to the area, um, and he's been helping out with the youth group. He did communion last week. He's done the singing this week, so he's just really been a blessing to our church, and if you haven't had a chance to meet this young man, uh, please take a moment to do so today after church. Um, before we start with the lesson this morning, we have kind of an exciting announcement for you. As you know, that Easter is coming up, and Easter is a fantastic time for you to invite your friends and your neighbors, and your family to our Easter services. And, and we'll take a break from Nehemiah that week, and we'll, we'll do an Easter uh, lesson of sorts. But it's just a great opportunity for us to reach out to people, because Easter is one of those Sundays that even non-church-going folks think about church. And what a great opportunity for you to reach out to those folks and say, hey, I'd love to invite you to church. Because even if they don't come, at least they know that you're interested in them and you're interested in their faith and that you would love for them to come with you. And even if they don't say yes right at that first time, maybe you'll open that door for a later invitation to get them to come join us here at church. The other exciting announcement is on Easter Sunday morning, we are going to once again begin with our live children's worship. And that'll be outside on the playground at the preschool. Um, Glenn and Sandy have been working really hard to get this all put together um, in a fun way for our kids and also in a safe way for our kids as well. So if you are a family with young children, we would love to see you on Easter Sunday and we'll have something for the kiddos as well. So that takes care of the announcements. Let's get started with our lesson for this morning. We are going to jump back into the book of Nehemiah. And if you've been following along with us, you're kind of up to speed, but just in case you haven't, We are talking about Nehemiah, and this is about 450 years uh, before Jesus came to earth, and we see that Nehemiah had been given this vision by God, and that vision was to restore the city of Jerusalem. Now, that's important because this was the city of God. This was the blessed city. This was the city where God's presence was to dwell, and it had been reduced to ruins by the Persians. They had completely destroyed the city, burned the gates, knocked down the walls. The city was in shambles, and the people had just kind of gone to the wayside as well. Much like the city, the people had stopped following God and the things that God had wanted them to do. So that brings us to last week. Last week, we saw that they started this process of rebuilding the city walls. Now, it's a really cool story, and if you missed it, I want to encourage you to either go back and read it or go back and watch the live stream from last week because we talked about the fact that everybody had a part. We saw everything from the high priests to the perfume makers side by side rebuilding this wall and working together. And that's what we talked a lot about last week was this idea of everybody has a part. And if we truly want to build something special, it takes all of us working together as the family to do that. So this week, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week. And again, last week, we saw that he, Nehemiah had kind of placed people uh, around the wall and, and placed them in specific places. Uh, The high priest did the the gate where the sacrifices came in and he had some other folks who were, you know, building right outside of their homes And he had kind of placed everybody around. And that's where we're going to pick up today. So we're going to pick up today in chapter 4. And here's the good news. That God will turn our troubles into triumph. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Nehemiah, you know that in chapter 4 is where they start to kind of run into some resistance. They start to run into some of the naysayers and some of the people who are not on board with this idea of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But what I want you to be on the lookout for today as we work through our story is how God turned those troubles into triumph. Now, we're not promised an easy life, right? We're not promised that everything is going to be roses and that we're going to have everything that we want and everything's going to work out perfectly for us. We know that as Christ followers, that sometimes things get really difficult. 
even when we're focused on the work of the Lord. And that's exactly what happens to Nehemiah in our story today. But if we trust in him and we follow his plan and his vision for our lives, then he'll turn those troubles that we have into triumph. Because, see, there's something funny that happens. Funny, not haha, funny, ironic. But when you are doing the work of the Lord, when you are doing your best for the Lord, is when things seem to happen. Because here's what happens, is when you're doing great things for the Lord, now you become a target for the enemy. Right? Because he doesn't want you to do great things for the Lord. When you're not really doing anything, maybe you're not a believer, you're not really following God's plan, well then... then then the enemy kind of leaves you alone because you're not really a, you're not a threat. But see, Nehemiah was doing this great thing that the Lord had given him a vision to do. So now he's become a target and he's become a threat. And that's what we're going to look at today as we move forward in our story. Frame of reference for you, John chapter 16, verse 33. I want you to be thinking about this verse today. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. It says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I want you to think about that today. As we not only think about the, the struggles that Nehemiah had, but as you think about those struggles that maybe you have in your own life, I want you to remember this verse where he gives us this reassurance. See, there's this really cool theme in the Bible, and that theme is fear not. Don't have fear. You find that over and over and over again in the scriptures. And that's because God knew that we were going to need that reassurance and we were going to need that hope and we were going to need that help. So he gives it to us over and over and over again and says, hey, I got this. You don't need to worry. You don't need to fear. I've got this under control. And that's kind of the thing that we're going to look at today. So let's jump into Nehemiah. We're going to be in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and as usual, I'm going to encourage you to read along with me, either on the screens or in your Bible or on your tablet or whatever you like to read Scripture on, because I think it's really powerful to not only hear these words, but to read these words as well. So let's read this together. It says, When Sambalot heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. It says, And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Let's go ahead and continue with verse 3. It says, Tobiah the Amorite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down the wall of stones. So here we see that, that Nehemiah is starting to run into this confrontation, right? And we kind of introduced these, these kind of bad guys, right, a, a little while back in our story. But, but here we see them again because they're not going to let this go. They've launched this psychological warfare, right? The kids today say things like, haters going to hate, right? Well, that's exactly what we're looking at here. We're seeing the haters are going to hate on Nehemiah and his crew, right, that are rebuilding the city because they don't want that to happen. Has this ever happened to you? Do you have people that you work with that don't want you to succeed? Do you have people that don't want to see you be successful? You know, in this this world of social media that we live in, there's this odd thing that's happened where social media has become a place to tear each other down. For some reason, we don't want to see other people be successful. We don't want to see other people get their dream job or their dream house or their dream car. And when they do, we tear them down. We say things like, oh, well, they they must have inherited that. They didn't work for that. We say things to tear them down out of our jealousy because we don't like to see other people be successful. And that's exactly what these guys are doing in Nehemiah. See, they don't want Nehemiah to be successful. So they're mocking him. They're making fun of him. This last part, it says, even a fox climbing on the wall could break it down. He's basically saying, look, you guys are wasting your time because that wall is not going to stop anybody. So they've launched this this psychological warfare. But but who are they really mocking? Are they mocking the workers? Are they mocking Nehemiah? No, they're mocking God. 
They're mocking God and his plan and this vision that he's given Nehemiah to rebuild the city. So this isn't just about the people. This is about the bigger picture, which is that they're actually mocking God. So let's look at these two, these two gentlemen that we see, right, for lack of a better word. We see that, that Sambalot was a Babylonian. Now, why is that important? Because where were the Jews just in exile for 70 plus years? In Babylonia, right? So he had an allegiance to Persia, and we've seen throughout his life and his story, he had an allegiance to himself. He was one of these guys that was looking out for number one. Now, we also know that he was a very influential person. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, he actually becomes a very high-ranking political official later on. And that's important that we know that, because as he's trying to stir up this crowd, right, that's outside of the city, as he's trying to stir up this crowd, he's a person of influence. He's someone they probably would have listened to. He wasn't just some guy shouting insults. He was somebody they would have looked up to and they would have listened to. And he had no interest in honoring God. He's actually just the opposite. He's trying to stop what God is trying to accomplish. And then we've got his, his cohort, Tobiah. Now, this is interesting. His name, his Jewish name, actually means God is good. Am I the only one that thinks that's a little ironic? That the guy who's trying to stop God and his followers, his name actually means that God is good. And just like his partner, he has no interest in honoring God. See, these two guys are the naysayers. And maybe you can think of some naysayers in your own life. People that just don't want you to be successful. They just don't want you to be happy. That's exactly what Nehemiah has going on. So that gives us a little bit of confidence and a little bit of hope, right? Because now we know this has been going on for over 2,000 years. This isn't something new. But remember, God is there to fight our battles with us. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, Hear us, O God. It says, For we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give, their, <laughs> give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. It says, Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. This is, an interesting, this is an interesting prayer, right? And we know that Nehemiah's go-to is always prayer, right? And there's something powerful we learn from this. We learn that when things get difficult, the first thing we need to do is pray. But it's interesting the prayer that Nehemiah gives. He's basically saying, hey, do back to these guys what they're doing to us. Give these guys what they deserve. Have you ever felt that way? And maybe you haven't prayed that prayer, but have you ever felt that way? That when people are doing bad things to you, you just kind of, like in the back of your mind, man, I wish something bad would happen to them. Well, that's exactly what Nehemiah is doing. So he had the right idea, let's go, let's go to prayer. Let's go to, to our fallback, which is always prayer. But it's interesting that he prays this very short prayer, basically saying, hey, give these guys back what they're doing to me. Please, God, I'm just trying to do your will. Have you ever felt that way? I think that Nehemiah is such a relatable character because he just does things that we can relate to, that we can understand. Because I think we've all been there, maybe consciously or subconsciously, at some point in our lives, we have said, man, I just wish that guy would get what's coming to him. Now, we're going to skip ahead to uh, verse 6. It says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their hearts. So I love this, right? Because here's this opposition. Here's this influential leader who's standing outside the walls, who's stirring up the people, right? It's that mob mentality idea. He's stirring up the people, right? What are these guys doing? These guys can't rebuild the city. What are they going to do it in a day? They can't do this. A fox could knock that wall down. So here's this guy, and he's out here, and he's riling up the people. And you can just imagine this scene, right? You've got the people on one side of the wall who are working diligently to try and rebuild this wall. And you've got the guys on the other side just mocking them every step of the way. And clearly these guys have nothing better to do, right? They're just outside, riling up the crowd, trying to get people fired up. But here's the key to this verse is that last part where it says, for the people worked with all their 
heart. See, the people didn't just say, oh man, we've run into some opposition here. I'm afraid of what this army is going to do. So you know what? Let's just stop and go home. We're good. See, when, when you run into opposition, two, one of two things is going to happen. You either learn and grow and move forward and get better, or you say, I'm good, I'm done, and you walk away. See, I love this because our example is not to walk away. Our example is to keep going with all of our hearts. We talked earlier about being a Christian is not always easy, right? It's worth it, but it's not always easy. So when people come in and they say, well, what are you doing? You believe in something that doesn't even exist. You believe in a plan that doesn't even exist with a creator who doesn't even exist. Why don't you just believe in science like everybody else? Do we just throw up our hands and say, ah, you know what? <laughs> You're right. Of course not. Because we believe and we have faith. And see, Nehemiah and his people believed and had faith. And instead of saying, ah, opposition, we're good. I don't need to do this. No, they did just the opposite. They put their head down and they went to work. And that's exactly what we have to do, is put our head down and go to work. Let's pick up in verse 7. It says, but when Sambalot and Tobiah, the Arabs, it says the Ammonites and the people of Ashad heard that the repairs to Jerusalem excuse me, the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. It says they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So here we see that psychological warfare didn't work, right? It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to just hurl insults. Now they're saying, look, that didn't work. It's going to get physical at this point. They're saying, look, it wasn't enough to stop them by just insulting them and mocking them and making fun of them. So we're going to have to get physical. So now they're stirring up not only the crowd that's gathered, but they're stirring up the people from the surrounding areas to say, hey, let's go to war. Let's stop these guys. This is not going to be as easy as we thought it was going to be. And then we see in verse 9, right, what does Nehemiah do when things get tough? They herald insults. Nehemiah prayed. They're planning to get physical. Nehemiah prays again. It says, but we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. I love that. I'm going to read that again. It says, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. See, they prayed and they posted. Right? They prayed and then they took action. They didn't just say, God, just take care of this for me. No, they said, look, God, we know we have to do our part, but we want to turn to you and lean on you in this difficult time, in this uncertain time, in this time that we're scared. Does that sound familiar? We're in a time where people feel unsure. We're in a time where people feel scared. Are we praying and posting? One of the things I always tell my youth group when we're talking about things like prayer is you can't pray for an A and study for a C. And some of you who aren't in school are like, well, I'm not in school. What the heck does that mean? Okay, well, you can't pray for a promotion and then slack off at work. It doesn't work that way. See, we have to play our part. Yes, God is amazing. Yes, God is omnipotent. Yes, God will take care of things for us, but he expects us to do our part. God did his part when he sent Jesus, right? But we have to do our part by remaining faithful, as Doug mentioned earlier. It's a two-way street. And I love that Nehemiah gives this example that they prayed, and then they posted guards as well. Let's go ahead and move forward to verse 10. It says, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the walls. It says also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. 
It says, Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. So see that the bad guys, their plot's working. Their plot is working. They're getting more and more people on board. And they're trying to convince the workers that, look, over and over, ten times they tell them, no matter what you do, they're going to kill you and they're going to attack you. Opposition. They're running into some serious opposition. Now, we're blessed that we live in a place where we can worship and feel safe. But that's not the case everywhere. If you look at the news, if you look at the headlines, if you look at what Christians face in other parts of the world, we have it made. And maybe we haven't been able to gather the way we would like to gather. And yes, there are some restrictions in place. and We have to kind of keep our distance and things like that. But it's nothing compared to what Christians face in other places. Look at Nehemiah and his group. They're being insulted. They're being mocked. They're being threatened to be killed. Does this ring a bell for anybody? Jump ahead 450-something years, 480-something years. When Jesus came to earth, right? Same thing. He was mocked. And he was threatened. But he stayed the course. Nehemiah and his group stayed the course. Let's look at verse 13. It says, Therefore... I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. See, these families came together to protect the city. These families came together to protect their homes to the point that they actually picked up their weapons. They picked up their weapons to say, look, I'm not going down without a fight. And brothers and sisters, we're in a fight too. Are we going to continue to follow Jesus with all of our heart and soul? Are we going to pick up those swords? Are we going to pick up those stones? Or are we going to let that opposition convince us to give up? Let's look at verse 14. It says, After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. We have to do the same thing. We have to fight for our children. We live in a world where there is just unbelievable things going on out there. And guess what? Our kids have access to it right there in their pockets on their phones. They do. We're in a fight, just like they were in a fight. And just like this says, we've got to protect our children and our spouses and our homes from the enemy and from the evil that the enemy brings. See, it's not the people we have to worry about. It's not the people we have to worry about. It's what's behind the people that we have to worry about. See, I'm going to say some things and you guys aren't going to like it. <laughs> we, we've watered down the gospel a lot to the point that we've lost focus. Okay? We, we have to remember that sin is real. The devil is real, and hell is still hot. And I know we don't talk about that much anymore because we like to keep it, you know, light and positive and all that, and that's great. But it's real. And if we don't fight against it, it will win. Nehemiah is telling us, look, we have to fight against it. And brothers and sisters, we have to do the same thing. And it may not be physical warfare like what they were facing, but it's emotional warfare. And we got to protect our minds. And we got to protect our hearts. And we got to protect our families. So we're going to change gears. How do we do that? Ephesians chapter 6, 
This is a very familiar passage for most of you, but I think it's crucial that when we're talking about how do we protect us and how do we protect our families, this is how we do it. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, read it with me. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. It says, put on the full armor of God, so what you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what Nehemiah was doing, right? They were putting on their armor. They were getting ready. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realms. Again, it's not the people. It's what's behind the people. It's the force behind the people that we have to be worried about. Verse 13 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and the breastplate of righteousness in place. Verse 15 says, And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's how we do it. Now, we're not going to read the rest of Nehemiah chapter 4, but I want to encourage you to do that because a little bit later on, and, and I think it's, it's verse 19 and 20, it actually talks about the fact that while these people were working and building the walls, they had a sword in one hand and were working with the other. I love that visual, and I want you to think about that. While they were doing their work, they had the sword in their hand ready to defend against the evil. Do we do that same thing? Are we ever vigilant? Are we working with one hand and defending ourselves and our families and our homes with the other? Because we should be. And I love that so much. I want to encourage you to read the rest of that. Unfortunately, you know, as we're going through Nehemiah, we can't read every single verse. But there's some great stuff in the rest of chapter 4 that for time purposes we're not going to get into today. But I want you to read that. Because I want you to be inspired by the fact that they were literally working with one hand and ready to defend themselves and their families with the other. See, we can't focus on the rubble and the trouble. We've got to focus on God. Because guess what? The more we focus on that, the more it pushes the other stuff away. Nehemiah got that. And he inspired and instilled that in the people that were working with him. So let's look at the takeaways. Let's look at the things that we can apply to our daily lives as we try and do the same thing. Remember, people are not the problem. It's what's behind the people that is the problem. We got to pray and we got to post. We got to pray to God because that should always be our go-to. But then we got to do our part too. Don't, Don't pray for an A and study for a C got to prepare. we got to prepare. See, Nehemiah had a plan. He had a plan. He prayed. He posted. He put his people around. He made sure they had weapons. He prepared for the battle that was coming. Are we preparing for the battle? Are we praying? Are we reading our Bibles? Are we ready to defend our families and our homes? we got to prepare. we got to partner with God, and we got to partner with each other. And we talked a lot about that last week, so I'm not going to get into that one too deeply. But we've got to put on the whole armor of God. I know that's a familiar story for most of us, and I know a lot of you have heard that 20 or 30 times. But don't let it lose its meaning, because it's so important. Just as a soldier would not have gone into battle without the proper equipment, we've got to do the same thing. As we get ready to close out today, I want to just give you the opportunity that if you've never had the chance to give your life to Jesus Christ, you have the opportunity to do that this morning. Maybe you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The baptistry is filled, it's warm, it's ready to go. We would love nothing more than to assist you in doing that. Or maybe you've been a Christian your whole life. Maybe you've been a Christian your whole life 
and you've just lost sight of the goal. And you've fallen away to the side. What a great opportunity for you to make that right this morning. We'd love to talk to you. We would love to pray with you. We would love to help you in any way that we possibly can. Or maybe you'd like to place membership here at the Church in Mission Viejo. We would love to welcome you into our family with open arms. If there's anything that we can do to assist you, we want to invite you to come forward as we stand together and as we sing. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. How I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. Gratefully thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jesse, for that wonderful song service this morning. Just a couple of quick announcements before we are dismissed. I want to remind you about our midweek Bible study. We come together every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock via Zoom, and they just started a brand new series on the book of Genesis. So if you haven't had a chance to join us for our Wednesday night Bible study, this is a great chance for you to get in as we go back to the beginning of the Bible to see how everything started. So we want to invite you to join us on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Also, next Saturday, there will be a combined young adult and youth group hike. We are going to get outside and get some exercise in the fresh air and spend some time with one another as we hike to the top of the world. So if you need any information about the hike next week, please reach out to myself or to Michael Wexler, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Again, thank you so much for being here. We'll be back next Sunday morning at 1015 for our children's worship and at 1030 as we continue our study through the book of Nehemiah. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, and we just thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We are truly blessed beyond what we deserve. Heavenly Father, as we studied this morning, please just help us to be prepared and to be in prayer and to just post up and be ready to defend our families, our homes, and our church. Heavenly Father, most of all, we just want to thank you again for sending your Son You made that amazing sacrifice on our behalf, not because we deserved it in any way, but only because you love us so very much. Heavenly Father, help us to never forget that and help us to return that love to you. Most of all, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your son. It's in Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you for being with us. Have a wonderful week.